Parker Schnebel, luckiest day of my entire life. Hope keep watching for more details. Hi guys, what's up? My name is Alana. Welcome back to my channel, like this video and enjoy this video. Don't miss the main topic of this video, so let's start the latest update. Gold hunting is known to be a lucrative venture, but when miners begin to go deeper and become more experienced, they end up discovering things different from gold. Some of them as useless as scraps of metal and others as valuable as gold itself. What happens when gold miners stumble upon items that have nothing to do with gold? What would they do if they found something more valuable than gold? Join us as we dive into how Parker finds mammoth tusks in his hunt for gold Parker Schnabel's unusual discovery. Parker Schnabel is not a stranger to getting down on the ground and getting his hands dirty while hunting for riches. He started working on the family mine in the first season as a teenager. Starting in the second season, the young man took the reins of the family mines, and since that time, he has consistently been one of the most successful gold miners. Whereas other mining bosses often struggle, Schnabel seems to have the Midas touch, hauling in thousands of ounces of gold per season resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars for his team to take home. After 10 appearances on Gold Rush, Parker has set aside a dime fortune for himself, estimated to be about $10 million, and he isn't slowing down anytime soon. But gold isn't the only thing the miner has found in the fields. He revealed he had found some other unusual objects during his excursions. It is safe to say here that a lot of stuff is buried underneath the earth. Among all the digging and excavating, miners have likely found strange things in their travels. Forget gold as Parker stumbles into what could easily be the delight of many archaeologists. He shared the unusual discovery he made while mining for gold in an interview with the Maelstrom, where he talked about what's arguably the most valuable thing he had that wasn't gold. He revealed that he had found a well-preserved pair of woolly mammoth tusks, which was fascinating. The tusks are remarkably well preserved because they are made of ivory and were buried in the permafrost, shielding them from the harsh weather. Some came up in pristine conditions, even though the woolly mammoth became extinct thousands of years ago. This discovery of preserved remains and fossils reminds us of what makes a creature. It is not entirely unusual to discover mammogram tusks in Alaska. They hold considerable value and fuel a thriving industry. Since these tusks are made of ivory, when well-preserved, their value can be pretty insane. They can fetch a price shooting up to and exceeding $1 million each. While Parker and his team on Gold Rush may not uncover anything that will surpass the value of gold, mammoth tusks rank very highly among valuable finds. Suffice it to say that the mammoth tusks he found would be worth a pretty good amount since there are people out there willing to buy virtually anything. However, despite the value and potential worth of the tusks, Schnabel reveals that he would not sell them. To sell things like that would require obtaining various permits, a process he chooses to avoid going through. Instead, he has a different approach to the tusks. He prefers to keep them. He thinks they're so cool and should be kept rather than sold. And one cannot blame him. He already makes hundreds of thousands of dollars from the gold he finds, so holding on to the unusual finds along the way makes sense, especially when he can proudly declare ownership of well-preserved mammoth tusks. So, if you ever find yourself in Parker Schnabel's house, don't be surprised if some massive mammoth tusks are there waiting for you. The mammoth tusks are the icing on Parker's successful career choice. Since there's no indication that he'll halt his career anytime soon, it can be said that more discoveries await him. It seems like the discovery of an unusual treasure on Gold Rush is yet to end. As a prominent figure on the show, a gold mining legend stumbled upon something stunning. Another unusual discovery on Gold Rush Tony Beats stumbled upon a significant discovery on his new site in Paradise Hills. Rather than the usual gold discovery, he unearthed a tusk that held a peculiar significance for this part of Alaska. He noticed the tusk protruding from the ground 
while exploring the site, and with the help of his son, Mike, and their machines, they successfully excavated the find, which Mike initially thought to be a jawbone. Tony decided to bring in paleontologists to examine it closely. Regarding the tusks found on Gold Rush, experts believe that the woolly mammoth skeleton found earlier may be part of the same family as the tusks. Miners have continually uncovered such bones since the Klondike Gold Rush over a century ago. The Yukon area is especially renowned for its record of Ice Age animal discoveries. Although Tony mentioned that he had found skeletons of horses and zebras in the past, this, in particular, caused people to remember the woolly mammoth. According to Gold Rush, the baby mammogram is estimated to be at least 30,000 years old, and the preservation of Ice Age animals is attributed to ice conditions and the ground in the region. The mammoth tusks are not the only strange things seen in the Gold Rush. Miners have seen things other than the god they set out to find, and Parker especially came face to face with something that blew his mind. Face to face. With the welcome stranger Parker Schnurbel could hardly believe his eyes when he found himself face to face with a replica of Welcome Stranger. The object is the largest gold nugget ever found. In Season 4, Episode 2, titled Installment of Gold Rush, Parker's Trail, we saw that he was half a world away from the Klondike Gold Rush Trail as he pursued new adventures and opportunities. At the beginning of the episode, Parker and his associate Fred Lewis were welcomed by fourth-generation Aussie gold prospector Tyler Mahoney, who swung open her truck door to reveal the two-foot-long golden boulder placed across the back seat. According to legend, the welcome stranger was so large that to fit on a bank scale, it had to be broken into three pieces on an anvil, based on the rate at which hold is sold in the present day the nugget would be worth around $4.7 million. The original welcome stranger had long been melted into gold bars, but two exact replicas continue to live on. One is owned and in the possession of the descendants of Deason, and the second is on display in the old treasury building in Melbourne. The one pulled from Mahoney's truck is assumed to belong to the Deason family. Erected in 1897, an obelisk that marks the location of the Nugget's discovery still stands in Moliagel. It wasn't Parker or any other modern-day gold miner who found it, so the question is, who made this monumental discovery that left even Parker dumbfounded? In the 1850s, thousands of people with hope for significant finds traveled to Victoria, Australia in search of fortune as part of the Victorian Gold Rush. They came from across Australia and from other parts of the world. The euphoria didn't last for too long. While some people struck jackpots and were made for life, great wealth was never achieved for most. But for two Cornish miners, fortune did come calling on February 5, 1869. John Deason was born on Tresco in the Isles of Scilly, but moved to Pendeen in West Cornwall as a one-year-old after his fisherman father drowned. This is where he met his would-be partner, Richard Oates, and both are recorded in the 1851 census as working in the tin mines of Conmore. Mr. Deason emigrated to Australia in 1853, with Mr. Oates following up a year later to begin life as a gold prospector. In 1862, they arrived in Moliagel, and after seven years of getting by and making a living, the two men struck gold. The marvel they found, which etched their names in history, was on a slope called Baldur Gully. An enormous piece of gold encased in quartz was buried just below the surface. It was so big that, as Mr. Deason wrote, he tried to pick up the nugget with the pick, but the handle broke. He then got a crowbar and raised the nugget to the surface. They took it to Dunnerley, about 12 miles away, where it was weighed at the London Chartered Bank. The nugget was immediately broken up because it was too large for the scales to make a model or take photographs. The drawing was made based on the memory of those who saw it, and there is now a replica stored away in the Dunoli Museum. Miners in gold-rich areas continue to unearth significant discoveries, 
Parker Schnabel has proven himself to be a force to be reckoned with. Let's take a brief recap of his remarkable journey. The electrifying Nugget Season 10 of Gold Rush unfolded with Parker navigating a landscape of new claims and cutting-edge technological advancements. Amid the hustle and bustle of mining, a noteworthy moment emerged the discovery of the electrified nugget. It was a rare and unique find that sent waves of electrifying excitement through Parker, his team, and Gold Rush fans. The anticipation for more significant finds reached its peak when Parker embarked on his quest, where he hoped to haul and expand his operations across Klondike and Scridna Creek. The electrifying nugget weighed approximately 41.8 ounces and earned its name from a mesmerizing dendritic crystal attic resembling lightning bolts. The distinctive feature of the nuggets sets it apart from other finds and makes it a rare geological wonder, adding a premium to its intrinsic gold value. As the season progressed, episode 15, titled Million Dollar Payday, became a strong contender for showcasing the electrifying nugget. Ultimately, the electrifying nugget adds a dazzling chapter to Parker's hold mining legacy. Its market value is elevated due to its rarity and unique crystalline beauty. Its place is cemented as a memorable and symbolic find of the gold rush. The Eureka Creek Bounty Season 7 of Gold Rush unfolded as Parker embarked on a daring adventure. Amid a series of challenges, from battling equipment failure to unstable hold yields, and the risks of unexplored terrain, he experienced a harshness of the mining industry. Even with this, he was undeterred. He invested in cutting-edge technological advancements and fine-tuned his operations to match his challenges and have a dramatic turnaround. In mid-season, there was a remarkable transformation, and viewers watched how Parker's efforts at Eureka Creek began to yield fruit. A sustained period of impressive gold recovery followed, hence the moniker Eureka Creek Bounty. Episodes like Eureka Payday and King Knopf Klondike became the crescendo of this bounty. Parker consistently recovered substantial gold, exceeding fans expectations and surpassing his previous hauls. There was unrestrained joy as the team celebrated the fruits of the combination of their hard work and perseverance. The significance of the Eureka Creek bounty as a turning point sets it apart from the others. His consistent recovery of gold in the area solidified Parker's position as a leader in the competitive world of gold mining. The sustained success allowed him to expand his operations to other areas and invest in more advanced technology and improved equipment. Despite all the gold Parker has found, he is not spared from losses either. He has had significant losses since he started his career as a 16-year-old miner. Let's take a peek at some of the losses that he has suffered. Historic $3 million loss after putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into a certain area in Alaska, Parker and his team banked 108 ounces from tailings left by old-time gold miners. But the real icing on the cake was a particular area called the Wolf Cut a virgin ground that could probably hold over 2,000 ounces and was estimated to be worth more than $3 million because of its amount of gold. This wolf cut is a really important pit, so important that they even tagged it the most important pit of the season just in terms of the information it got. The area is pretty deep, such that Parker's crew took two months just to get to the pay layer of the cut. But some things never go as planned. This was the crew situation. Some weeks before, a devastating flood had turned the wolf into a lake. It was so problematic that Parker thought it would have been better to go with all the money to Vegas than drown in the flooded wolf cut. But Parker, known for his tenacity, refused just to give up the place. The crew managed to battle back the water after a bit of struggle, and Mark Falls, the foreman for the operation finally came down to pay dirt. Parker was determined to find out if there was enough gold to warrant them going all in. He went to one area and loosened the dirt, but it needed to be more impressive. Moving to another area in the cut, he finally found some fine dirt 
indicating gold in the area, Parker decided to leave the crew to work and return in two days. But when it seemed everything was going all right and they would get their hands on some gold, something stunned the entire crew. A hole was blasted in the wall and mud and water were pouring out. It was obvious that nature was not totally on their side that day. The water they thought they had successfully gotten rid of had returned. This time, it was stronger than before and posed a greater threat than the previous one. The crew did not expect this to happen. The wolf cut was in danger of being filled with it again, and in turn, they were in danger of a huge loss. While digging for pay at the bottom of the cut, an excavator struck the side of the pit and uncovered a waterlogged mine shaft, flooding millions of gallons of water back into the pit and covering the pay grounds. The crew was not unprepared. The problem was that they needed to be prepared more. They already had one 8-inch pump, but more was needed to tackle the water. The crew got the second pump in motion, but it didn't make much difference. Water was still coming in from every angle. After firing their two pumps, the crew lost their fight against the water. Their only option was to pull the pump from the wash plant. But it was such a big decision, and Parker was in the position to make that call. The problem was he was not there, nor was he answering his phone. They were stuck in a dilemma. If they did not pull the pump from the wash plant to support the other two pumps, the whole area would be flooded, and they would lose the pay in the wolf cut. The amount of loss would be staggering. Tyler made the hard call and shut down the wash plant, pulling its pump to double their draining power. They had nothing else to do but leave the area while the pumps did their job. The pumps removed 10 million gallons of water in 24 hours. Parker finally returned with huge expectations to see a wolf cut's first cleanup. Instead, he was greeted with stories about the flood that happened. But Parker's problem with water had not ended just yet. In another episode, he had another encounter with water when his mining ground in the wolf cut was completely submerged. Submerged mining ground in Parker's claim in Alaska, he was chasing a pay streak in the four-acre wolf cut, which he hoped would deliver at least a thousand ounces for him this season. The team was trying to access the pay dirt, which was 30 feet down, and they had to haul out 1,000 yards of overburden. They had four more feet before getting down to water level, and from there 30 feet before hitting bedrock. But things weren't as okay as they initially seemed. They were working the operation right next to a pond, and water would be the first if they had any problems. The solution was perfect frozen mud because it kept the water out. Recruit John Beaudry was tasked with handling the mud and blocking out the water. But the cut seemed pretty wet, they had to call their boss in. Otherwise, it would not be good if things got out of hand. It turned out that the more areas they opened, the worse the mud got and the faster it spread, yet they had not even gotten a fifth of the cute out. The wolf cut sits alongside a relatively old pond. What separated the two was simply a narrow berm, not enough to withstand water pressure if tampered with. As the crew dug down, they exposed frozen permafrost, holding back the water. The permafrost was struck and now allows pond water to seep through the berm, flooding the cut. There will be a lot of water in the area soon if they let it continue. Something had to be done to salvage the situation. They thought that their best option was to get a pump. Parker's plan to fight back against the water was to dig a sunk pond at the deepest part of the cut and install an 8-inch pump to drain it. He wouldn't lose another fight for water. After the installation, they had to wait until the next day. Their whole plan was good and seemed viable and efficient, but how does one simply pick a pump to drain water of the magnitude coming out of a pond without first checking it to be sure it works and fix whatever issue it might have? The next day arrived, and the whole team trotted out to check out their perfectly dry and ready-to-med wolf cut, but they were in for an unpleasant surprise. Their pump was nowhere to be found. The pump seemed to have disappeared, and instead of a perfectly dried-up cut, they came face-to-face -face with a lake. 
the pump system had failed woefully, flooding the cut and submerging their pump under four feet of water. Half a million dollars was on the verge of slipping through their fingers. The pump was completely underwater, and they could not even walk up. Tyson had to get a little kayak paddled out with a chain in the excavator to get the pump to dry ground so they could work on it. According to the foreman, Mark Fors, the suction filter at the end of the hose was blocked with debris, causing the water level to rise and submerge the entire pump. He had to strip and service the engine and devise a plan to make sure that further flooding did not harm the pump. Parker has shown himself not to be easily shaken by setbacks. If we're talking about them, he's had many. Despite all that, he went ahead to achieve something that left both miners and fans stunned. Concluding a season with $14 million of gold Parker Schnabel and his team had set out on a season that could very well be one that would redefine the very essence of gold mining. When winter was at its coldest, the stakes were suddenly higher as every scoop of dirt held a great potential to do one of two things, make or break their dream. A sense of urgency followed immediately after the start of the season, as Parker worked around the clock to orchestrate his team's efforts to, to unearth the precious material. Alaskan harsh conditions were not to be underestimated, they put their mental health to the test. But with an iron resolve, they confronted the challenges before them, navigating treacherous terrain and dealing with faulty machinery to find their treasure. As the leader of this determined group, Parker had to use his leadership skills, honed over the years with trials and triumphs, to strategize every move with precision. The air was heavy with expectations, but he remained undeterred, guiding his crew through the treacherous landscape, strengthened by the belief that the Klondike held the key to a life-altering fortune, which, when found, would make their troubles insignificant. Their long sought after breakthrough finally came when they struck a rich vein that seemed to stretch beneath the icy ground endlessly. The joy that erupted in the mining camp was contagious as they witnessed the unveiling of a method and a very substantial deposit of gold, enough to turn their entire season around. After a series of disappointments and crushed hopes, the Klondike had yielded the treasure it held. There was still a monumental task of extracting the wealth from the frozen earth, and Parker stood at the helm to color the task. The good news spreads fast. The same can be said for this discovery. The news spread like a California wildfire, attracting attention from mining fans and skeptics. Parker and his crew were put on center stage as the world watched to see how the process would be handled, thereby mounting significant pressure on the crew. The prospect of a million-dollar haul loomed on the horizon. As winter became even colder, the race against time also became a factor that would determine the crew's success. The extraction process intensified, with heavy machinery extracting the gold-laden dirt from the earth. The combination of their efforts was spectacular, as the gold room where they kept their loot bore witness to staggering revelations. With a mixture of pride and disbelief, Parker Schnabel announced the total of their loot, $14 million in gold. His crew, the community of miners, fans, and skeptics were all in awe of this groundbreaking achievement. This season of Gold Rush has been firmly etched into the annals of Klondike history. A celebration ensued, bearing a testament to the camaraderie formed in the crucibles of the Klondike. The crew, exhausted from all the hard work, realized that their grit, perseverance, and resilience had yielded fruit beyond their imagination, a fortune beyond expectation. For Parker, the $14 million was not just a financial windfall, but a journey marked by resilience, tenacity, and a relentless pursuit of gold. As the season wrapped up, Parker emerged not just as a top earner, but as a modern-day Klondike mining legend whose name will be synonymous with the success that unfolded in the heart of Alaskan mining grounds. Parker's scheme is easily one of the most resilient in the entire gold rush, and through their tenacity, they have gotten astonishing results and made discoveries that leave people staring at their screens in wonder. But the team is not the only one with resilience. 
our NYE tough phone cases are out for sale this year. Do not miss out on this. Grab yours now by clicking on your screen or clicking on the first link in the description. What do you think about Parker's remarkable journey and these unusual finds? Let us know in the comments. Thank you for watching my video.